Uh, my name is Catherine Hayashi. I'm the Chief Financial Officer here at the Centre for Drug Research and Development. Uh, what we are is a not-for-profit that works with researchers at hospitals and universities to help advance their drug development ideas to a point where they're more commercializable or investable. So as a, as a young student, I, was, I have a BCom from UBC. And when I was, um, unfortunately, when I was going through my BCom, uh, there was the financial meltdown of the late 80s. It was a terrible, terrible time to be looking for a job in finance. And coupled with that, it was a double graduation year where they merged the five-year program and the four-year program. So not only were there no jobs, there was double the number of people looking for no jobs. So uh, one of my friends said, oh, well, why don't you apply for an accounting position because they'll, they're recruiting for finance and accounting students. I said, oh, well, OK, at least I'll get a summer job out of it. So I got a summer job, which led into me being offered a permanent job. And, you know, and again, accounting, no one, I never spent any time in high school <laughs> thinking, oh, I love accounting. That would be so great. There would be nothing better than to be an accountant a, as my dream goal. Um, but once you're actually in it, you're like, oh, you meet these great people, and you work in a team atmosphere, you get things done, and uh, it was, you know, they said, wow, you've, you're a great student, we'd love you to come on full time. So I articled at Ernst & Young, and I left there to go traveling, so I went backpacking, and then when I came back, I had to get a job, because I was broke from backpacking, and they said, oh, well, you know, you're, you're great, why don't you come back and work for us, at least for tax season? So I went back and worked for tax season. And then one of the guys that I worked with said, hey, well, you know, my brother is looking for a controller. And I think you'd be a great fit. You should just call him up. And I'm like, oh. So I phone up this guy. And he said, oh, yeah, come on down. He interviews me. And he offers me the job on the spot, basically. And I said, oh, OK, well, that's great. So I started off my first industry job. Uh, I worked there for a couple of years. And then a partner that I had worked with at Ernst & Young phoned me up out of the blue one day, and he said, hey, do you, uh, you still like music? I said, yeah. And he said, oh, because um, I've got a client, and they're a record company, and they're looking for someone to be their controller, and I thought of you. Uh, do you are you interested? And so I go over there, and they um, interview me, and then they offer me the job. So I ended up transitioning to what, at, at that time in my life, was my dream job, right? I got to go work for this record company, which was fantastic. Um, and then I stayed there for about six years and got promoted to be the general manager. So I kind of developed a broader skill set beyond accounting. And again, that's all just, oh, well, Catherine's good at dealing with problems. Maybe she can do that. Oh, well, maybe she can take this other project on. So I left there um, for another opportunity because my husband had been offered a job outside of Mexico. And then when I came back, um, I said, oh, well, I'm back. I'm looking for a job. Again, a guy that I had articled with phones me up and says, hey, well, you know, I'm working for this biotech company, and I need somebody. Um, and I know you don't know anything about biotech, but you're pretty smart. I'm sure you can figure it out. So why don't you come and work with us for a while and see if you like it? I said, oh, great. So I worked there for a while, and I got promoted to CFO. And then through you know, having beers at conferences, I met uh, the woman who hired me to be at CDRD. And I phoned her up to congratulate her on a deal that she'd gotten done. And she said, oh, hey. I was, she was, I was meaning to call you. Um, I'm looking for a financial person to come help me out on this new thing. Do you know anyone that might be interested? I said, oh, well, that sounds pretty interesting. Why don't we talk about it? So we talked about it. She offered me my current position. And I mean, literally, I have not actually applied for a job since 1980, blah, blah, blah. I won't, I won't. <laughs> I won't mention the year. But really, it is the value of I can't believe that person I had drinks with 15 years ago is still thinking, oh, well, she's pretty good, and I worked with her before, and we should call her and see if she can help us out. And maybe it'll be a good fit, and maybe it won't, but the opportunity is there. And that's really, you know, truly how most people get the best jobs. In uh, on my volunteer activities, I'm a director on the Child and Family Research Institute Board, which is the research arm of the Children's and Women's Hospital. I'm also on the board of the Documentary Film Festival Society in Vancouver, which I think is kind of a good balance for me. Um, yeah, and I like music and travel and all sorts of things.
So I've spent quite a bit of time with uh, grad students in different ways. I've been a volunteer mentor for the Sauter MBA program uh, for a few years, and so I've had uh, several mentees um, that have been in the MBA program. Um, there have often been people that have got a technical background, so engineers or scientists that are trying to use the MBA to transition to a more business-focused career. Uh, so that's been really interesting, sort of seeing people really learn a whole different skill set and then try to leverage their past into their future. And um, interesting to see what, uh, what people have, have done and, and ended up doing, not necessarily what they thought, uh, but uh, I think they've all been really glad for the experience. Um, and also at CDRD, we have a training program where we have co-op students. We also have postdoctoral fellows and some grad students. Um, so we have an internal men mentorship program there. So um, each year we're assigned a different mentee through that program. Um, always interesting to see the kind of development of, of people in that stage in their career where they're really transitioning from a very academic uh, point of view to really often getting their first taste of really what it's like to work in a more industrial setting where we're setting targets and milestones and deadlines and it's, uh, it's always, it's always a, a growth experience for them. Well, I did, uh, I took the liberty of asking one of our scientists who's, um, he's a scientist that's had several years of experience both in academia and industry and I said, well, what, do you, what do you think? And he looks at me and he says, well, do you like money? <laughs> and he was being facetious, but he was also being serious in that um, it, it, there is a difference. There are more opportunities in industry to have a job that pays you a good salary. Um, not that you can't make money as an academic, but there are, relatively speaking, fewer high-paying opportunities. Um, but I think the, the real thing is, well, what, what will make you happy and fulfilled? And the thing about being an academic is, if you really like being a free thinker, where you're free to think about what you want or think about a problem in a different way. Um, that's something that is rewarded and expected in academia. You can take a long time thinking about the problem. You don't necessarily have to write anything down. Whereas in industry, while you still think, and we expect all of our people to think creatively, um, it's a very focused kind of problem solving. And you know, someone is telling you what problem to solve and suggesting a timeline where you really, really need to solve it by. So it's a different, uh, it's a different mindset. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the stuff that people find really rewarding in industry is having a project, working with a team, hitting a milestone. A lot of people, what you ended up studying in school is really only a launching point. And for example, our scientific director at CDRD, his original area of study was physics. And he ended up being uh, one of the most successful drug developers in, you know, in Canada, really, which is a far, far cry from where he started off in physics. So you've got to be able to take what you know and leverage it into where you want to be, and that may shift. Your network is so important. I mean, the worst kind of job is the job that you have to apply for, and you're one of 100 resumes um, that, uh, that come across someone's desk. You want to have a connection to whoever it is that's doing the hiring who already has a good impression of you because they've heard about you from somewhere else. And someone who understands kind of what you want in life and whether you might be a good fit for wherever you're going to be. So that building that network, well, how do you build a network? Well, you've got you to get out there and find something that interests you. Like, there's no point in spending time in something that absolutely do doesn't interest you. Find something that, for whatever reason, is a passion and give time and energy to it. And I think, you know, as I get older and more advanced in my own career, I can absolutely see how important it is. The people that I had beers with when I was 20, um, now that I'm in my 40s, come back and are truly a help to me in my career now. So um, I think every job that I've had has involved someone who's worked with me or dealt with me in the past and liked it and has offered me some opportunity in the future. So we've interviewed lots and lots of people over the years. And, um, and truly, you, what you always end up with is a group of resumes that are all pretty good, right? They've hit some minimum bar, of they're pretty smart, they've published some good papers, they worked with some good professor, they've got a reasonable reference from somebody or other, 
And then you have the interview to see, well, who is actually the best fit? And that's what really that next level of opportunity comes down to is fit, which is determined by the interview and by reference checks with talking to people that you worked with before. Um, and I think especially a lot of younger students aren't used to doing a lot of interviews and it can make a huge difference. I think what you have a chance to do in an interview is really get across you're a good communicator, you're a good listener, um, you, can, um, you can answer questions that are complicated in a reasonable, thought out way, um, that you can talk about how you worked in a team, that you can talk about how you displayed leadership. Um, you know, I think we, you, know, we have, you want people that are gonna fit into your team. You want people that are fun to work with or good people to work with or, you know, there's a kind of a, an intangible, would that person be a good person to be, a, to be with on a daily basis? And one of my other colleagues has uh, what she calls the airport test. Could I be stuck in an airport with person? Can I be stuck in an airport with that person for four hours? And if the answer is no, they're probably not going to get hired, no matter how good your resume is. So be, it's easy to kind of look at, um, oh, well, I wrote this paper, or I got a 95% in a course. In 20 years from now, no one will care what your transcript said. It's all about what did you lead, who did you do it with, how did you build your team? What did you accomplish? And those are, those are things that, um, that you really have to focus on, and that's the big transition from um, academic world to the real world. You know, I think there's, there's lots of smart people that know a lot of technical information about things, but what is really going to set people apart and what really makes a difference in their long-term career is these kind of soft skills about are you a good communicator? Are you a good listener? Can you motivate people? Can you lead people? Can you solve problems with your team? And those are things that you, know, you really can only do by doing things. You have to just roll up your sleeves and get in there and do it. You know, I think part of also what people can do, whether it's you know, within your dream job or not within your dream job yet, whatever you're doing, work hard and be nice, you know, be a kind person, be helpful and work hard and opportunities will follow.